So I am just so happy to be here and to talk about a passion of mine, which is healthy aging and how we are going to live vitally and successfully as long as we can. And you should know that just recently, the first 100-year-old man finished a marathon. So, yeah, it, <laughs> I know. It took him six hours. So he did it slow and steady, which tells us that there are so many possibilities that await us in our 100th year. And so in my conversation with you all today, I want to talk about the value of exercise. And in fact, I think all of us can talk about how wonderful uh, it is to age gracefully and lovely. But of course, a lot of us would love to have the fountain of youth pill. And actually, we have found out through research that there are probably two things that come very, very close to a fountain of youth. And we're going to talk about both of those. Um, successful aging. When we talk about aging, we are really talking about management of all of your optimal resources as you go through your full lifespan. And that's the ability to do everything in your life that is important to you and to have the energy and vitality to do those things. And my guess is that all of you are doing that. You, know, you have family and friends and wonderful hobbies and interests and travels and things that you do and how important it would be to have the resources to do that. So the definition is really having the ability to function in any way that is important to you, okay? And so if we want to talk about what are two things we can do to promote this ability, the research suggests that there are two. And the first one is having a healthy attitude about the reality of the fact that we are getting older, we are getting wiser, and it's a darn good thing. And so this is a really interesting research project um, that was done at Yale University with 660 men and women. And what they did was they interviewed these people in 1975, and they tracked their longevity for the next 27 years. And what they looked at was how happy are you to be getting older, and is this a good thing? And interestingly enough, the people who had a high positive self-perception of aging lived an average of 7.6 years longer than those that had a negative view. So embrace your, your, your wisdom, embrace your aging. Um, I was so happy when I got my AARP card when I turned 50, and I'm just, I'm just really enjoying um, being wiser. I, I really wouldn't want to have a 20-year-old brain anymore. So um, it's very good news that having a positive attitude about getting older is a positive, wonderful thing. So keep that in mind. Keep embracing everything that you're doing. That is so important. So the next thing to look at is we know there are challenges in getting older. We're all dealing with that. Thing, our body slows down. That is, an, that is somewhat of an inevitable process, but it can be changed by the second fountain of youth, which I'll tell you right now is exercise. Um, loss of water from cartilage. I think we all notice that, that when we get up in the morning, we're a little stiffer, but movement is the best way to keep that from happening or keep that from slowing us down. The second thing that happens is that we get some loss of elastic fibers. So do you find that you're a little stiffer? Sure, I, I certainly notice that. But again, all these things can be changed, or, or at least the trajectory downward can be reduced by exercise. So you can stretch those fibers. You can move. You can keep yourself mobile. You can eat healthy. You can keep a good attitude. And these things will, will not be at, these things should not interfere with your quality of life. Slow reaction time, and um, we may notice that we don't move as quickly. But again, the good news is that exercise can help that be better. In physical therapy, we have a saying uh, in our profession that use it or lose it. And science has shown that to be true in brain function, that if you keep your brain sharp by always stimulating, we actually grow new, new neurons. Did you know that? And so if you're doing things like learning a new language or playing an instrument or doing crossword puzzles or exercising, you're stimulating your brain to keep those neurons firing so that we can be sharp into our long lives. The same is true with muscle fibers. We need to stress those as well, not to the point of pain, but we need to do things like stretch, which lengthens muscle fibers. We need to strengthen, which means that we need to feel a level that we're working hard. And so what that does is it thickens fibers and causes 
all the little muscle fibers within the protein, all the muscle proteins within the fibers to grow, which makes you stronger. And if you practice balance activities in your agility, that helps your brain keep those neurons firing so that you have good balance and allows you, again, to have all areas of function that you enjoy. So the good news is that anything you enjoy that you can do for a period of time could be considered exercise. So what do you think the most common, most popular exercise is among all American adults? Walking. And by golly, the good news about that is that that's a natural thing for us to do. And you have such a beautiful area to walk in. I, I would certainly suggest that if you enjoy that, that's a great activity. But there are other things. What if you're unable to walk? Can you push a wheelchair? Absolutely. Can you do an upper body ergometer? You certainly can. Can you get in the pool and swim? You sure can. You know you've worked when you feel a little bit of overload. Okay, so we'll talk about the types of exercises that allow you to do that. So good news is you don't have to do any really specific regimen. You just have to have fun. Okay? And so we're going to talk about four different types of exercise, and we'll be demonstrating those and talking about those. But if a perfect fitness program would contain all of these, okay? And all of them are necessary to, again, keep you vital, keep you vibrant, keep you doing all the things you like to do. So balance, okay? And we'll talk about different ways of doing that. You don't need fancy equipment. You can stand on one leg. I like to practice this. Stand on one leg and brush my teeth and see if I can maintain one leg balance. Um, and even just that practice is useful. Um, strengthening and resistance. So those are things like lifting weights on one level. But your best resistance can be your body. So if you're doing things like push-ups or sit-ups, you are using your own body weight. And that can be helpful. And we'll show you some of those things. Flexibility and stretching, keeping the range of motion in your ankles, in your hips, in your shoulders, so you can do all the things you want to do. Um, and we'll show you lots of ways of doing that. And you can do anything from yoga to just getting up in the morning and touching the floor. Aerobic and endurance exercises, those are the things that keep your heart strong. Your heart is a muscle. You all know that. Keeping your heart vital, keeping it strong, keeping it able to meet the demands of your activities. The way to do that is raise the ceiling of what your heart can tolerate by regular endurance activities. So things like running, things like bicycling. We'll show you some of those things as well. Okay? New York Times had a huge, huge front page article right after New Year's about why most Americans fail in their New Year's resolutions within the first month. And the, it's hard. You, it, how many of you have to really plan to do your exercise on a regular basis? You have to literally put it in your schedule. You have to make a date with yourself. I find myself arranging sometimes some of my obligations so I can get my work, workout in because if I don't do that, I don't feel like I'm very good for the other things that I need to do. So, and as a physical therapist, I don't think I'd be very effective with my patients if I'm unable to to move them or, or have the energy to get through my day. Dr. James Fries is a physician at Stanford, and here's a quote from him. If you had to pick one thing, one single thing that came, to the closest of the, came the closest to the fountain of youth, it would be exercise. So there you have it. If there's anything you can do, at any level you are, no matter where you're at, there is probably some form of exercise that you can do and enjoy. I love that. It's a couch potato, a true couch. Um, I, again, I mentioned that I, got, I get ARP magazine, and I'm so delighted because there's some wonderful, really great articles. How many of you read that on a regular basis? September, okay, well, September 27, 2001, issue said that sitting is now considered the new smoking. Isn't that terrifying? If you sit more than 10 hours a day, you are at the same risk of, as, as, in terms of chronic disease as smoking. Terrifying. So here are some of the diseases, and probably some of us have some of these. That's not unusual. Um, heart disease, cancers, congestive heart failure, depression. Um, exercise has been shown in, study, in several studies to be as effective as some medications. Hypertension, the number one chronic disease complaint of uh, United States of America. Uh, type 2 diabetes, obesity. Um, I think 30% of the American public is overweight. Um, osteoporosis, 
peripheral vascular disease, a lot of things that you really would rather do without. One thing we will talk about is frailty, because what can happen is if you start losing your resources and you stop moving, you can become more vulnerable. And we'll be talking about that concept, because that's something we want to try to avoid as long as possible. Okay. If you already have a chronic disease and by, or chronic condition, um, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation says that 75% of people over the age of 65 have at least two chronic conditions. And those are things like hypertension or arthritis or diabetes or other things. Exercise is extremely important for preventing more debility. So we need to try to keep ourselves moving. 20% of Americans over the age of 65 have some sort of movement limitation, some sort of functional limitation as a result of the chronic um, condition. So again, those are things that we want to try to avoid. Exercise can slow the progression, again, of the downward spiral. All right? Does that make sense? You've heard, these, you've heard all this before. All right? so, what is it, so what does it take to get off the couch, and why do so many people have difficulty? This is from uh, Healthy People 2020, from, the, from our government talking about the way we are now starting to look at health, and it's called indicators of health. When you look at all the different health conditions that we face as Americans, um, these, here are the four core areas that we're talking about, but why don't most Americans engage in all these activities? Well, this is where, when you start looking at some of these other things, culture, coping, brain health, what sort of medications are you on, what sort of illnesses might you have? What other things in your life contribute to your ability to exercise? They either support that, or perhaps they may make it more difficult. What if you have an environment where it is not even safe to go outside? What if there are no facilities for you to exercise? Many people in, in urban areas have difficulty. One of the other areas is if your nutritional status is poor, you may not have the energy to exercise. And there are many parts of this country at, where they have what, are, what would be called food deserts, major demographic areas where there's no quality food. It's all junk food. There's no organic food. There's no fruits and vegetables. And if you don't eat well, you don't want to exercise. Um, and so setting up your environment in such a way and setting up your social support system, keeping your nutrition, having... Um, coping skills that perhaps include exercise. Here are the best and the worst of what can happen with aging. And so this is vigor. The concept of vigor means do you have healthy resources available to you so that you can do all the things that you want to do. And here is aging as you get older, up to 100, okay? Is it possible to be highly vigorous when you're 100? Well, the fact that somebody can run a marathon when they're 100 kind of is a suggestion that, yeah, I think you can. So most of us want to, my guess is that most of us in here are in the fun stage where we have the resources to do everything we want to do. If you want to go hiking, if you want to travel, if you want to do something enjoyable, you've got the energy. More importantly, if you become ill or if you're injured and you have some sort of health setback, if you're in the fun stage, you've got extra resources so that you are likely to recover and bounce back. It may take you a little longer, but you'll do it, okay? Function, as we go down, is our health declines. And I want to make the point that one of the things that will cause your health to decline is lack of exercise. Then you move into the function, which is getting through the day. You can do what you need to do, but you'll become exhausted if you have to go above and beyond. And your resources are such that you may bounce back. It may take you longer. You are possibly at the threshold of having a health crisis or something that is significant enough to move you downward. Does that make sense? Do you understand that? Now, here's where we really don't want to be, and that's frailty, where now you're, you are fairly limited. You're less active. You may be in, at risk for falls. You may, you may be recovering from... Um, injuries, okay? Your resources at this point are fragile. Well, you're in a frail state. So a major illness and injury is, is possibly life-threatening at this point. And then the last point is failure, where you're really dependent in most of your activities of daily living, and your health is, 
is very frail and very tenuous. Okay? So my point being that chronic conditions aside, and we don't always have control over those, I, I do know that, um, exercise can help keep us up here. Does that make sense? Have you heard these terms before? Okay. So frailty in physical therapy, that's a big issue for us because what we're trying to do is determine can we help people who are in the frail stage? And the answer is yes. I don't mean to imply that if you go to the frailty stage, you'll never recover, but you will need to work hard and exercise within your capability, build your endurance, build your flexibility. So if these are some diagnostic tools that we can use to kind of determine, do we have a person here who may be in this, in this place? So self-reported exhaustion three or, three or more days a week. Now, this will be a consistent period of time. I don't know about you, but I do have those like around the holidays where things are just exhausting, or if you've got stress that you're going through. But this is your standard way of being, three or more days a week of just being really tired. Being weak, and the way that that is measured in, in research is by grip strength. You ever used a dynamometer where you just hold, try to grip a dynamometer and see how much force you can exert? For women, that would be, for men and women, the indicator is the lowest 20%. So for women, that is less than 23 pound grip strength. And for men, it's less than 32 pounds. So that's just an indication of upper body strength. Unexplained weight loss. Mo a lot of us want to lose weight, but nobody wants to do it and have no idea why. And so if it's unintentional and it's been in the last year, that is possibly an indication of another system that is failing. Here is what we're finding in physical therapy is really interesting, and that is that the, as you start to slow down, walking speed is correlated with mortality. The slower you walk, the more imminent, the more likely you are moving towards um, a, a failure state. And look, okay, so slow walking speed. So these are really interesting ways that we can determine this. Now again, the good news is if you're here, we've had, we have a neurologic uh, clinic up at Flagstaff at Northern Arizona University. We have patients with all different types of disabilities, a lot of patients with Parkinson's disease, a lot of patients with stroke. We're seeing phenomenal gains through regular intensive exercise. So I'm not trying to suggest that you're doomed, but you will be, uh, you will be exercising a little bit. So here are the sorts of things that um, physical therapists and other healthcare providers may do, and maybe you've had some of these tests, and these are determinations of overall fitness. Um, walking speed is the ability to, it's called the timed up and go test, and it's the ability to stand up from a chair, walk 10 feet, turn around and sit back down, and we time that. And 15 seconds is considered within the normal range, and as you go, Slower than 15 seconds, your, incre your likelihood of fall increases, and again, the trajectory towards failure is, is possibly more imminent. Um, endurance, another test that we do for people who are able to do this is a six-minute walk test, a measure of stamina endurance. How far can you walk in six minutes? Sit to stand. This is a fun thing to do, and you can try this, but how many times can you, come to how many times can you go from sitting to standing in 30 seconds? And so why do, you, why, why do you think we'd want to, we would care about how many times you can sit to stand? Any thoughts about why that would be important? It's, it, it, it could be hard on your knees, but your quadriceps muscles are one of your major stabilizing muscles for walking. And if your quadriceps muscles get weak, you are less likely to feel stable when you're standing and walking. And that can contribute to a, to a feeling of instability, which may lead to fall risk. Um, the time needed to walk up 10 stairs. So these are real simple functional tests. Um, timed up and go is the test. I also mentioned it as a walking speed test, but it also functions as a balance test. Um, the ability to get off the floor to standing. Okay? We, we try to train all of our patients in getting off the floor, and you all know why that would be important. If you fall and you can't get up, you could be in a world of trouble. So these are really simple diagnostic tests that can be helpful. So the point here is that these things slow down as you move through the fun, function, frail, fail state. Okay? So it's just helpful to know that these are parameters that you can use that, that kind of help you judge what your functional capacity is. But we can also use these as a measure of improvement. And that's what we try, you know, 
as physical therapists, we're always trying to move our patients to the best place where they can possibly be, and we have seen these scores go upwards as well through exercise. And that's very common and very possible. Okay? So uh, lots of great things. Here are some other fun things that we are learning about rec from research about the benefits of uh, regular physical activity. One of the more interesting things that we are doing in neurologic research and physical therapy and in, in medicine in general is finding out can we slow or reverse the trajectory of motor problems in Parkinson's disease. And some of you may be familiar with Parkinson's disease, but with that d disorder, you wind up slowing down, you wind up moving forward, you wind up reducing your range of motion so that you become more vulnerable to falls, and you may find your voice quality getting lower, and eventually everything just really, really slows down. We're learning a whole series of activities that reverse that, and that is moving big and loud and ways that stress the nervous system to recalibrate to a more functional level. Does that make sense? And so you're going to probably later on see a couple of video clips of me uh, having some of our superstars moving big and loud, and it, it looks funny, but that is proven research. Um, we also know that it improves cognitive function. So if you're exercising and you're active, it keeps your brain sharp. It keeps blood flowing to the brain. How many of you even just notice that after you exercise that you just feel clearer and sharper? And I know if I have a big project I need to do, I will take the time to exercise so that I don't fall asleep over my papers and I get, my, I get what I need to do. Improving mood and stamina. Here's another thing. As we, as we age, we tend to slow down, but the irony is that we tend to find ourselves having more problems sleeping. Did some of you notice that? And it's frustrating. Exercise can improve sleep quality. And there's nothing more satisfying than having a great day of activity and, and hitting that pillow and being out. And then, of course, improving easier, making it easier for weight control. So I hope I have sold you. On, and, I, and again, I, I know I'm speaking to the choir here, but... Um, all the wonderful things that exercise can do. And I know I'm speaking to the choir, but there are days that we all have that it's just easier to think about putting it off. But it really is one of the very best things you can be doing for your whole body. Okay? So we are going to talk a little bit more specifically about each of the four types of exercise. So if you were to come up with a prescription, what would be some suggestions? And again, these are just targeted suggestions. Um, in general, and what's really nice about this is that the research shows that 30 minutes a day or 150 minutes a week is a target, but what if you do three 10-minute bouts a day? Is that okay? The answer is yes. You can spread it out. I find myself sometimes walking the parking lot before I go into work or, oh, by the way, my little, my little fun thing that I've learned to do is keep a pedometer on me at all times. Uh, some of us measure our blood pressure every day. Some of us measure our blood glucose. I measure my steps every day. And do you know what the target, you know what the target recommended steps per day is? 10,000. Yep. Sounds like you're doing that. Are you trying to do? Good for you. And there's been studies done in Europe about women who do that on a regular basis have 40% less body fat from exercise, walking regularly 10,000 steps a day. So 30 minutes a day, 50, 150 minutes a week, moderate intensity, such as brisk walking. You see these poles here? You're going to see one of our superstars doing that. But one of the ways to add upper body strengthening into walking, if you don't want to lift weights, is using Nordic poles. And I don't know about you, but I will be as efficient as I can anytime it's an opportunity. So 20, 25 minutes three times a week for about 75 minutes total, if you want to go vigorous. So you have options. How nice is this? You can do it slow and steady, a little bit longer, or you can do it more intense. So whatever works. Okay. I started with three and a half. You see, so warm up. Look. Very important. Okay.
You like to dance? I love it. What kind of dance do you do? Anything. Okay. Dance is fun and a great activity. I've taken modern dance and jazz dance and stuff in my earlier years. Okay. And it all helps. Strengthening. Okay. At least twice a week. And the major muscle groups are the ones, the pec muscles, the ones that hold your shoulders back, the hips, the ones that stabilize your hip abductors, the ones that bring your legs out to the side, your, your gluteals, the ones that bring your legs back. All, you, you have all these wonderful stabilizing muscles in your hips that keep your balance. So those are helpful. Core muscles of the trunk. Yeah, we have to do sit-ups. I hate sit-ups. But having good core strength is important for posture and important to... Um, allow you to have a good anchor for your arms and legs, essentially. Um, chest, I've mentioned, shoulders, arms. So the main benders and straighteners, if you will, okay? And I don't, you don't have to go buy a workout Nautilus gym. You can do push-ups. You can do wall push-ups. You can do mini squats. You can use elastic band. Um, you can even do resistance in the water, too. You know, you can use... Um, different types of equipment that, um, like, I think they're like noodles, and you push them down, and they create resistance. So there's lots of ways to do that. Let's have some of our superstar show. So straightening each leg. Just straightening, having weight on it, and lifting it. Ooh, okay. Lifting it ten times like this, and after those are over, I lift it ten times in just this this position. Okay. You're on next. What would you? Okay. Let's just try. One and down. Two. Beautiful and down. Down. Excellent. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So the only pressure that's on that I can relieve from my knees, uh, that instead of having all that weight on it in the gym, but in here the water helps relieve that. Yes. Because I started with a completely severed Achilles tendon and had that repaired. Mm. Then the next year had a knee replaced and then last year had a hip replaced. Okay. And so each of those requires a certain amount of babying, Absolutely. but they do need exercise in order to stay loose. last one is balance and skill. So we're talking about any, there's lots of fun ways to do that. Sitting and exercising on the mobility ball. You all have a really lovely gym here. And I think you have, you had all the equipment. I brought some down, but you have the big balls. Have any of you ever tried just sitting and doing nothing more than bouncing on it? You will find that that alone causes your trunk muscles to, to tighten up. So it gives you some stability. And there's balance involved in that. And then you can get more and more creative with arms and legs and all different things. Um, even things like, I mentioned standing on one leg, brushing your teeth on one side, flossing with the other side, side stepping. Doesn't have to be really fancy. Walking from heel to toe, okay? Walking on tiptoes, walking on heels. Um, I just try to make a game of it um, when, I, when I think about it. Walking on uneven surfaces. So lots and lots of different ways to do that. This is just doing this. And now for balance, we're just going to do one, two, two. Just, and you may not be able to bounce, so let's just start with doing this. One, two. Yeah, just slide it out. If, it, if that, what I was just showing you was too hard. Okay, good. And down. So these are simpler exercises, but for someone who is just trying to keep their balance, this is a good one. Oh, you want to 
lungs. Yeah, can you feel that? I'm kind of just practicing your balance on it. But you can do it. What do you think of that? <laughs> Got it? I got to Got to get your... There you go. You're doing great. Doing great. Yeah, and the other thing in terms of balance is Tai Chi. Does anybody do Tai Chi? I think you all actually have classes here. There have been some really interesting studies on the value of Tai Chi for balance. Plus, um, I have friends that do it, and they say it's a really meditative thing to do. I've traveled to San Francisco, and there are some beautiful parks where there are all these people just doing Tai Chi. It's just lovely. And stretching. I lied. I said, th th this is it. This is the fourth one. Five to seven days a week. Now, as we get older, you need to hold stretch longer. So gone are the days where you can just bounce and be done. So you need to hold it, but that will really lengthen. And, and Bill and I here are stretching our heel cords. And again, muscles that pull us inward are the ones that get tight. So we're looking at stretching up and back. Okay. Um, hamstrings, heel cords, all those things that make us stiff in the morning. So just big. So, and we count loud too. And now you're going to bring your knees from side and go real slow. Keep your shoulders flat. Keep your knees together. And arms down. Yeah. Okay. And I want you to feel the nice stretch in there. You feel that? Keep your knees together, as far as you can. Good. Does that feel good? Uh-huh. Okay. All right. Beautiful. Okay. Just the idea is the idea is moving big. The idea is moving large. Yes. Yeah. So getting started. I, again, all of you are doing this. I'm, so, I'm just, it's just delightful. Um, but just keeping motivated. Uh, it's always important to consult with your physical, th uh, with your physician. Get a safe clearance. Make sure there isn't anything that would be limiting you. Consult with your physical therapist. They can do assessment of fitness parameters that we've been talking about. If you're having problems with pain or discomfort, one of the areas of uh, physical therapy intervention is analyzing those and determining what might be helpful, what could be the cause and what can be helpful. And then they, you can get a, a prescription for an individualized movement program. And if weight control is an issue, um, you can consult with a nutritionist and perhaps do an entire fitness-based program. Okay? And staying motivated. Make it fun. If I have learned anything in... My 33 years as a physical therapist, it's got to be fun, or you won't do it. And we know this, right? Boredom is one of the reasons we quit. So if you've, how many of you have more than one way of exercising? Yeah, like what I do, I run two days a week, and this is my little passion. I hip-hop dance two days a week, and I walk two days a week. So that's six days a week, and then on the last day, I clean my house. That's exercise. <laughs> and by the way, don't discount the value of just everyday activities. Okay, so tracking your progress. Um, one of the things in terms of overall fitness and weight control, um, keeping a pedometer, and the other thing is keeping a, keeping a journal. And if weight control is a concern, how much are you eating, what, what's your caloric intake, and what's your activities? What did you do that day? And I love to flip back through all mine and give myself a reward if it was a good month. Um, I just, this was a question that came up in the community that I just wanted to clarify or just go through for anybody who had a question um, in terms of adjusting a walker. Um, and it's a pretty simple, straightforward way to do that. If you've got a walker, you're, it should really come to where your wrists are like this, so the height of your hips, so that when a person winds up then putting their hands on it, they've got a slight bend in their elbows. And so... Um, that was just something that came up as a point of interest. Does anybody have questions about that? Or You did fantastic. Uh. And all I can say is keep up the good work. <laughs> well, I, I just don't sit down all the time, you know. Well, that's pretty <laughs> obvious. You're doing great. 
so. I was born and raised on a farm. Were you? What? Were you? And I worked on the farm all the time, so I was always doing something. 